Hello and you're very welcome to another J Mark podcast. I'm John Man. Of course, this podcast is brought to you by Orcaretch.com and the Tactic D. Use your promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off on Orcaretch.com and get the best skins, gloves, equipment on the Tactic D. Be attack minded. And today I'm joined by former Derry footballer uh, Jared O'Kane to talk about Derry's great success last Sunday in the Ulster Championship, uh, Jared's career and Jared's uh, coaching experience so far. So, really look forward to talking to Jared today. How are you keeping, Jared? I'm keeping well. I say we're. we're... We're four days past Sunday now at this stage, so starting to your sleep pattern starting you back to normal and your eating pattern and all that sort of stuff because it goes and put awry for maybe forty eight hours there or that. But when you look back on it, if it happens once every twenty four years, it's well worth it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What what seldom is wonderful, Jer. What seldom is wonderful. And uh, you know, an unbelievable few days for the uh, dairy County as a whole, obviously Ulster Champions for 2022, Jer. so unbelievable scenes in Clonus last Sunday, so how's it all been? Oh, yeah, it's, you know, it's been great, you know, I say, uh, chatting to people there, and the fact that it hasn't happened in so long, I do find it quite emotional, and I was saying to someone there, you know, my wee lad, Ken, he's not massive in the GA, but always talked about this last week, is Derry, when's the quarterfinals, when's the semis? Who did Derry play? Who his favourite player is? Where he would never have asked me questions like that two weeks ago. And then I was saying like earlier, like, you know, people like my father who are massive in the GA, is big. My father was chairman of the county board for years, and to see him and Clonus with my wee boy and his all grandchildren, stuff like that, and you see three generations connecting. That's what sort of happened for people in Derry on Sunday. So to see that sort of thing, even aside from the football aspect itself, was great for Derry. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. The growing interest uh, definitely seems to be there, Jer. And like, yeah, we can we can touch on to the day itself. It was a, a superb day for the green, or sorry, the red and white of Derry. It was, it was unbelievable. The colours, the noise, the atmosphere around Clones and Sunday looked unbelievable. Kind of looked re- reminded me of the old days watching back the videos on YouTube, the flares and the, the flags and everything, Jer. So just an unbelievable day for the county of Derry. Yeah, well, I was chatting in also council official on Saturday. He was telling me that. Derry had sold out two and a half to one. It shows you the uh, the buzz it was about the county. I know it's completely different for Donegal being in their 10th final in 12 years. Yeah. For Derry, people were their first in 10, and it was only their second since 2000. Mm. So to take that sort of crowd to Derry, to a Derry match, and Derry, to be honest, Derry traditionally wouldn't be a massively full team to support. But now that the support's there, you can see them backing the players and sticking with it. I can't see that sport dropping off anytime soon. Yeah, yeah, no, it just looks unbelievable. I suppose touching on to the game itself, Jer, um, it obviously went to extra time and um, it was a real lip and tuck battle. And I was kind of a lot of people kind of been saying it was a you know a boring negative game of football, but my, me and myself personally, I thought it was just an unbe- unbelievable game compared to the other provincial finals. Whereas the Leinster and Munster was just a really a, a joke shop, really, Jer. And I know the Connacht final it served up to be a good game of football, but it was just an, an absolutely enthralling battle. It went down to the wire, and um, you know the result went your way. Yeah, well, I was at the game. I was doing a bit of work for some of the media, so I had a seat right on the halfway line on the Jerry Arthur stand right up the back. So I had a great view of everything. I'm talking a panoramic 360 view of even the crowd and the pitch itself. And right up until the, what, probably the 80, 89th minute, you're unsure if who's going to want it. I think that type of game, that like, I don't think anybody that wasn't there that is maybe lambasted. But to feel the atmosphere that was there. I, I'm talking, this was a tense atmosphere. Yeah. It was absorbing. It, there was a real pressure cooker environment down there on the pitch. And while it wasn't a score a minute, every every pass or every tackle. Play for death. Uh, you for, uh, you know, that sort of thing. Whereas I suppose if you're doing like for like comparisons with some of the other provincial finals that were on, they were over the contest at half time. And it's hard to keep supporters enthralled at that. Yeah. So, can you imagine being in Crew Park on Saturday and it looked good because the sun was shining, but can you imagine the, you know, the effect that it had on people in the hill if the rain was coming down? They'd have left the game way two months ago. Whereas at least if it had been a throng, they would yeah. stay to the end, but it looks good because the sun's shining on this great day, but an effect that weather doesn't make the game or the atmosphere. Yeah, yeah, no, I just thought it was an absolutely unbelievable game of football and it really could have went either way. And I suppose one question most with the performance, Jerry, obviously, it, like, you know, it was real kind of cat and mouse, you know, every like last 10 minutes of that game just looked like, you know, such a pressure cooker. So what impression most about the uh, Derryman's performance on the Jerry? Probably the same thing that they've brought to all the games so far, the hard running. 
you know, right up until the very, very last minute of the game day, I was still running hard. Now, Donegal was running hard too, but with 10 minutes to go, Donegal went two up, and I turned to Graham Devaney, who was sitting to my right, and I said to him, that's game over. I just couldn't see Donegal relinquish him three point lead in the last 10 minutes. Yeah. Now, there you only get two, and it went to a draw. But even at that, they get them two points within 90 seconds. They sensed, once they get the first one, keep the momentum going right away, and they turned the second one straight away. They pressurised uh, Pat and kick out, got it, and I think from that point on, Gary had all the momentum. Glass kicked away after that, and somebody else kicked away. Benny Heron missed the goal chance next to the time. Yeah. Gary had all, 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 Gary probably all the momentum from probably the 66th minute on. Yeah, yeah, no, it was just a sensational performance. And touching on to that as well, Jer, literally the last five minutes, even probably the last, last play of the game, the Derry lads were still running, the conditioning, the fitness levels looked unbelievable. I suppose Rory Gallagher's a lot to thank for that, but it was that that's obviously very impressive because like it was an absolutely boiling day and Derry were still had juice in their legs to keep going, Jer. So that's impressive that's impressive alone. Yeah, well Derry have done on the hard work to back that up. You would only hear snippets now, basically the county teams. Nowadays, the camps will be very closed, but you're hearing snippets of the work they've done, not over the last four or five weeks, over the last 18 months, and it takes that to build up that sort of engine. And if any county team has probably worked as hard or matched there in the last 18 months, they've been going way and above what the average county team is doing, because I know that's what Derry have done to get there. Now, it's hard getting to the top. It's even harder staying there. So yeah. they keep that going, and they keep that hunger and drive momentum going. Like, Rory obviously has been eating out the palm of his hand that way and fair play to them, you know, like they did have the conditioning done both on their legs and both strength wise as well, because you hear the stories of what they're doing and from the eighty seventh, eighty eight, eighty ninth minute, it was the day lads making all the hard runs. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was just it was just sensational to watch, and I suppose a few kind of star story performances. Obviously, a Derry probably as a whole, but obviously we, we we kind of talked off air about the impact Connor Glass has had even on his club, his county now as well. He's he's just had a sensational year last couple of years since coming back. Connor Doherty up front, Shane McGuigan, and ah, uh, just sensational performances all around here. So you know, some star story performances on Sunday. Yeah, I think uh, as we were talking earlier, it's no coincidence that Connor Glass has been home now. They've got to two years. Club have now won the first ever championship. They yeah, have now won the first Ulster title in 24 years. Yeah. I think the the assurance he gives to everybody around the team, not just his tackling and his covering, but having a few conversations with Connor and his mentality is a wee bit different. And that maybe comes from home from the professional environment. A lot of boys you see coming home from Australia take a long time to adjust and yeah. maybe aren't the player that they were perceived to be. But Connor has just excelled in the last year, 18 months since he came home. Mm-hmm. Add that into you, know, you have three man markers in the full back line, and especially Rogers and Conor McCluskey. You look at the guys in the half back line, there, and alongside them, you have McKinless, McGrogan, and Conor Doherty, all hard runners, with Byron Glass in the middle of the field. Up front, yeah, he was probably thought they have seen not have enough scoring forwards. Mm-hmm. Jim Wiggins has been now a brilliant scoring forward for the last three or four years at county level, but uh, over the last 18 months, if you look at the game Sunday, look at Niall, Niall Long and hit one one. Niall Toner causing baller all the time. He's, he set up a few goals. Benny Heron, while he didn't get the scoreboard alight on Sunday, scored two goals again. Mullen hit not four against Throne. Guys like that have been chipping them and they've been doing a lot to get over the line every game. Mm. I suppose, Jerry, obviously, I know Rory Gallagher has been in the shit the last couple of years, but has this Derry kind of success been brewing the last few years? Obviously, we've got the right men involved. I see Maliki Rourke's over at Glen Mahara, so he's a great lad to have about Derry yeah, club football. So, Jerry, like, has this success been brewing the last couple of years? Well, it probably has. You know, Derry was on their sixth minor final in eight years on Sunday there, and although they beat the four points in the end up, there was only a point and it was a minute ago. And Derry had been missing their captain. They'd be a lad from our club, Ryan Nickel, and he's a, he's a standout player at that level in Derry. And he would have probably made a difference at that point in the game. And their schools are going really well. Uh, between St Mary's Marafelt and Pat Mahara, have maybe won year four of the last seven McCrory's getting the Hogan finals. 2014, Mahara have maybe won two Hogan's. And that's all coming from that. Them boys are now 24, 25. You know, Shane Wigan, Conor Glass, and the guys played in the same Hogan finals that David Clifford School beat them and They're all now coming through to that level. It just maybe took them a year or two longer to find their feet. But the young guys then pushing them on. Yeah, 
Yeah, no, 100%, 100%. I suppose touching on to the Ulster Championship journey that you did have, obviously toppling uh, Tyrone, the All-Ireland Champions from last year. Monaghan in the next game, Monaghan were hotly tipped this year and then obviously Donegal last Sunday, Jair. So you didn't get it easy. You done it well and um, what a journey so far. Yeah, you know, they have done it the hard way and even getting into the final before the Donegal game, Donegal was probably state favourites. But if you flipped it around and Donegal had beat Tyrone, the All-Ireland, Champions by 11 and beat Monaghan before. Donegal would have been hotly tipped to beat Derry, but people still didn't know that confidence in Derry. Uh, you beat three Division 1 teams. I think Derry is the first team in any division not to get promoted with 11 points since 1993. Yeah. So their league campaign, while they didn't get promoted, their league campaign would be in very common successful. Usually you want to be promoted every year in the last 28 years. It's just the way the division fell with the two teams that. Competed at the Cork final, two very strong. There's probably three very strong teams in that division. Mm-hmm. And it was just nip and tuck as to see who went up. In the long run, it's obviously done very no harm, but you know, they definitely had about three, probably three of the top seven teams in Ireland to one also. Mm-hmm. No, it, it looks like a journey that's going to keep continuing. And I suppose touching on uh, to the game itself, obviously, like it, it re- again, as I said at the start, it really was nip and tuck, and I suppose. More heartbreak for Donegal, another Ulster final loss, and uh, Declan Bonner probably has more questions than answers with this uh, Donegal team, Jair. But um, just a sensational performance by the uh, Derry lads, and it really, really was nip and tuck. So the white heat of Ulster Championship battle, you know, to get over the line a game like that, very impressive stuff. Yeah, the fair stands of the players. The guy the Donegal, you know, we obviously, I don't know what goes on in their camp and that far be it for me to be. Criticizing Declan Bonner or Stephen Rutchford because them guys know their team better than anybody. But I did find some of their tactics a bit bizarre. If I had played against Derry, I wouldn't have done some of the stuff they done. But they obviously play it as they see it, and they mm-hmm. are more experienced with the guys they work with. But people probably will be questioning that they got beat in the final in 2000, beat in the final this year. Mm-hmm. Both of them got beat at the very end of the game. Is it maybe something that? And I think in Bonner's time, Bonner played three games that. Could have got to another semi final. He's been beaten all three. In the first year of Super 8s, Throne took them out in a one or takes all in the qualifiers in the mm. last game of Super 8. The second year of the Super 8s, he drew with Kerry and Crook Park. If they won that, they'd have been in the semi final. Mm. And the game after that, then they played Mayo and Castle Bar in the one or takes all. He had three chances to get them to an Ireland semi final. Haven't been in one since 2014. Yep, they still be regarded as a top four or five. Team. That's the so, bit I don't get. That's the so, bit I don't get. Yeah. People probably are asking questions internally and within Donegal, but uh, I suppose we can only look at our own county and worry about us. And far be it for me, I say, far be it for me to be critical of Declan Bonner. He's taken them to a couple of Ulster titles, he's taken them to finals anyway. So, yeah. you know, he'd always have something about them. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't know. I feel the days could be potentially numbered. I think he's one more year um, at the Derry job, or sorry, Donegal job, but I don't know if uh, there's no real run in the back door. We'll have to wait and see about Declan Bonner's future with the Donegal team, Jair. And I suppose uh, Rory Gallagher, touching on to managers, just seems like an absolutely superb fella to have involved. Where you see with the passion along the sideline, the way he conducts himself in interviews, everything, uh, Jerry's is absolutely football mad. He's had some influence on in Derry football, Jerry. Yeah, as you know, whenever Rory came in a few years ago, he probably split opinion on the fact that he was with for Manly before that and he had played really defensively. But he had said he played really defensively. You have to cut your cloth accordingly to see what players you have. So, whenever he came into Derry, his forward options are probably more than he had for Manor. And again, he's cut his cloth that way. He's also developed the players and he's, uh, I think he definitely has made players better. And that's what a coach is meant to do. A coach isn't just meant to pick a team on Sunday. A coach, in verdict commas, is different from a manager. And Rory's down is down as a day manager, but from what I gather, he's very hands on in terms of all the coaching as well. He makes sure he's heavily involved in it. That's probably his forte as well. And I would only know him fleetingly. I've never had a proper conversation with him since he took on the day job, but guys that do know him and know him quite well, or they always use just football and genius, and he's just, he just absorbed by it all the time. And yeah. I think in all the time, so I think that's rubbing off on the players. Yeah, yeah. And I suppose, Jerry, like, I suppose the big question is, and obviously to enjoy the uh, Ulster celebrations now, but how, how far do you think Rory can uh, kind of bring this team this year? Because I think like the outgoing opinion is like even after the Ulster final, he just kind of, you know, he celebrated, but it looks like a man that could be really, really hungry for more success. So I suppose it's early days yet, Jerry, but how far can this man bring this team? 
Well, Derry are on the side of the draw that don't include Dublin or uh, Dublin or Kerry. Kerry, yeah. So whoever Derry comes through in the back doors and where possible they can't play Trone again, they can't play Monaghan, they can't play Donegal where possible. It's a nice so route, yeah. Of the draw, then, I suppose it depends on who gets through, but the best team to have possibly maybe playing is probably Armagh or Mayo. Yeah. And if they did happen to draw any of them, I wouldn't be, not that I wouldn't be overly worried, but I think they would have enough in the armory to beat them. And should they get through that and on to a semi final, they would play the winners of whoever goal we played as well. It's always sort of taught Derry a lesson in the league. I think Derry have turned around since that. Yeah. You know, so I don't think Derry would fear enough. Now, that's not going to say that Derry is now going to walk into a final. They are only, they only take a game at a time, but they are only two games away from the final and teams on their side of the draw. Derry are very capable of beating. That's all I would say in that regard. Yeah, yeah, no, it could be a very, very fruitful year. Uh, it's at least yet for the Derry lads. And so, was Jerry? You obviously played Derry for played for Derry for so many years. So you know, obviously, you were played many Ulster Championship games. So maybe like the missing ingredient over the years. And Jesus, like Christ, you had some unbelievable players from years gone by. The Brady, the Bradley brother, uh, brothers, Muldoons of this world, Jerry. So you know, what do you think? Maybe was the missing link uh, from years gone by. Probably, you know, where we sit there and look at, we get a bit complacent in some of the games, you know. I, I was looking there one day, I got beaten five Ulster semi-finals in a row by five different teams. So it wasn't just the one team with the hoodie over us. Yeah. So a, a strong Armagh team beat us in 05. Mm. And they were probably at their peak there, and probably more so in 02 or 03. Mm. 06, Donegal beat us. 07, Monaghan beat us. 08, Fermanagh beat us. 09, Tyrone. And probably the Fermanagh and Monaghan games were the ones in between that we were heavily tipped as favourites to win the both of them. And even the Fermanagh game itself in 08, we were 1 5 to a point up after 10 minutes. Only 8 1. And the game just sort of slips away from you. And once the game's turning like that, it's hard to get it back into your control. Now, that's not to say we didn't have leaders in the team. We had guys like Paul McFlynn, Paddy, John McBride, Virgil Doherty, Niall McCusker, Kevin McCloy, Kevin McLaughlin. You can name them all. And they're all leaders there. And they were leaders around the club and Derry. But probably a wee bit of complacency, you know, like we definitely worked hard in that period. Of it. We worked as hard as all teams around us. But at that time, uh, whenever you're looking at it comparatively to now, teams now work a lot harder. But at that time, you know, it was all relative. Yeah, yeah, no, hundred percent. I suppose when you get the the right people involved as well, it, it's it's absolutely essential. And I suppose obviously, kind of touching on to that, we you, you know we have Maliki work now involved in Derry Football with with Glen Maharan, obviously Rory, um, you know managing the Derry Seniors chair. So I suppose you can nearly say the right people is kind of in place to lead Derry Club Football and kind of uh, Derry Senior Team now for the next couple of years. Yeah, well, obviously Rory's there. I think maybe Rory's done for four or five years. I was pretty surprised if he doesn't stay that course. Yeah, have been upward trajectory this last three years. Yeah. That continues. I say within, you know, within Derry Club football are some very capable managers. Mark, he's obviously the most high profile now in his first year at Glen the first ever championship. I think again that was just with the jigsaws fell in the face. Conor Glasgow was home. Mark I wrote and under the club probably didn't change a massive amount, but he just changed he took the took a few smaller things. Yeah. He's probably got Glen over the line themselves because Glen had been beaten the final two years before. They had a raft of underage boys coming through. You know, the year they won it, they were far away the best team in the area. I think the closest, closest any team got to them was eight or nine points. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, things are definitely on an upward uh, trajectory. And I suppose, obviously, uh, touching on to Sunday, like the, the absolute scenes after it, and we've seen Christ, like when all the fans run on, run on to the pitch, uh, after, in Clones after the game, the red, the white. The razzmatazz, the flares, absolutely everything, Jer. So just an absolutely special day in a space, special day at the office for the uh, dairy footballers. Yeah, and like they knowing that the work that's done over the years, they all deserve it. And looking back on, it, I didn't get to one of the championship, but I think every player deserves that sort of. Would uh, Would that be a regret of yours to not win an Ulster? Probably would be. You now we got bit in the final in 2011. You done a goal, made the break. Oh yeah, we lost. We lost Skinner seven days before to Cruciate. People also forget we lost Paddy in March of that year to Cruciate. Literally, the two of them were gone in a space of 10 weeks. And, you know, the Skinner one we just didn't have time to recover from. Paddy, we sort of had to adjust our game after. And we had navigated both Romana and Armagh that year. Mm-hmm. But once we lost Skinner the week before, 
the way they scored not eating that final, and that was for the tell its own tale. But again, if we had a deserve to one, one we'd have probably won it. And that's you know, whoever 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 won the championship got deserved it. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And I suppose touching on to the scenes afterwards, Jer, like, and oh, it just looked absolutely incredible. Even the build up to the game, everything around it, Jer. So, I suppose the good, even us G as a whole, maybe the good times back, crowds at games again, and probably I think that was the first Ulster final where you had a crowd uh, in Clonus since uh, twenty nineteen, Jer. So it was just great to see a bit of normality after all these years, Jer, at this stage. Yeah, well, Derry, Derry traditionally wasn't a massively supported team. I played in an All Ireland semi final. An 04 against Kerry, and there was maybe 17,000 at the game between the two teams in Coop Park. I think Derry maybe only took nine or 10,000 people to a semi final. You, you know, if you think of that now, it's madness. You know, all right, semi finals, you would probably get 55, 60,000 at them. But yeah. this last, you know, maybe it's to do with the pandemic as well. People haven't been out as much, you know, but this last uh, two years has sort of caught Derry people's imagination. Mm-hmm. And hopefully now that the fans are there. You get that wee bit of buzz for it and hopefully they stay there because of that. Mm-hmm. No, it's, it's brilliant to kind of see, I suppose, the new team. And I suppose touching on that as well, uh, Jer, like, and look, I know well, there's been a lot of complaints now, like the way the football championship's going at the minute. And obviously, Leinster, Munster, a lot of kind of getting a lot of slack, and you know, r- probably rightly so, Jer, at this stage. And there was obviously a call for change last year, that didn't happen. I know the Connacht's. Connor football's not in a bad place, but Ulster, only four Ulster. So it's great to see kind of Derry probably exciting the championship because really, Jer, if we didn't have to talk, if we couldn't talk about Derry, I don't know what we'd be really talking about, Jer. Well, I suppose you don't get the feel of the end games unless you're at them, I don't think. And if you were chatting in the people who are maybe in Bath on Sunday, they weren't there and they went to the to see it and feel the atmosphere and how tense it was. Yeah. It was cutting edge. It was right on the edge of your seat stuff. Yeah. Whereas probably hard to do a comparison with some of the other championships because they are like just procession and like the Dublin and Kerry plan for quarter final they plan so they plan everything around it right down to their training and right down to probably their team selections too giving giving different boys run outs mm-hmm. you know whereas teams in Austria can't afford to do that you know they had to beat three division one teams to get there whereas uh Dublin and Kerry didn't have that sort of hurdle to face and you can imagine if Dublin or Kerry was an Ulster one day, one day, and 10, 11, 12 yeah, yeah, no, it just looks unbelievable. And I suppose, as well as that, chair, um, you know, the journey that you did have in Ulster, like, do you think that'll be really good kind of preparation now for the All Iron Series? And obviously, Dublin and Kerry are hotly tipped uh, to get over the line, but I suppose there's all the talk with them, and I know there's a lot of talk with Derry now, but it kind of does suit you now that uh, route into the well, potentially, or well, not kind of jump ahead yet, but a, a potential All Iron final, All Iron semi final. Well. Them sort of games set you up well because you know you've been there and done it and you have been tested. So it'd be different if you come in the a, a quarter final or semi final undercooked and if you had two or three games and you weren't pushed to the limit, you might doubt yourself a wee bit. If you get to a point in the game you say, God, I well, if I had this in me, but the day lads can now say, Well, we've been here, we've done it, we have it in the tank. Uh, and because the challenge is more condensed this year, you're not waiting about as long either and the games are coming thick and fast and you can. Build up that momentum and take it with you. Whereas before, if you were playing the first round of Ulster in, say, the middle of May, you might be playing the Ireland quarter final to the middle of August. Now it's condensed inside. Yeah, his first round game was what five, six weeks ago. So now they can get that momentum going and carry it right through with them without it dropping off. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. I suppose, Chair, uh, touching on to kind of the talk at the minute, obviously, like restructuring, and we're, we're seeing what, so much talk about the Talton Cup, the PR around it, how uh, Sears teams are taking it. I know Derry's obviously on a great run in the All Ireland proper, Chair, uh, but your kind of take on the kind of structure and everything, all the talk at the minute? Well, I suppose we'll, not, we'll probably not know how the Talton Cup fares out until after it's finished. I would be disappointed in the way that they run the northern and southern side of the draws. A, because I think the northern side was a bit lopsided. B, I think familiarity brings that wee bit of contempt. So I know Cavan was playing for Manor this weekend, but I'm sure Cavan was Manor wouldn't have minded getting away playing somebody different. You know, rather than playing the same teams over and over again. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Like, I know that the GAF said that was to help alleviate travel costs and hotel costs and potential overnights. But, you know, teams are playing each other in the division one, two, three, and four all over the country. So it should have been no different for the Talchin Cup. I know the restructuring is coming into place next year and it might I'll probably take away from the other provincials. Mm. I think an Austin medal will still mean an Austin medal for people that want it. 
Mm, no, 100. And I suppose what's your kind of take on? I know Pat's plan uh, last weekend on the Sunday game said he's in massive support off the Tall Cup and says it like will really work for potentially the weaker teams. Suppose, what's your kind of take on? Suppose this whole damn comments and suppose the outcry of, um, talk of you know the last couple of weeks about where we're going with this uh, product as the uh, football championship uh, this year. Well, I think all the people who aren't first on the split season aren't involved in it, whereas there must be. Pundits, whereas I think the split season is a great idea. Given, it's only bring the all Ireland forward, final forward by maybe six or seven weeks. It's given clubs a far more of a window in the summer. It's getting 98 percent of the players in the country plan their summer holidays, plan everything else around it. Yeah, I guarantee if you ask every club, every county player, do people sort of forget it's also a club player? Yeah, they would. They're enjoying the split season because. They're not waiting a lag of four or six weeks between county games anymore. You're know, coming thick and fast every two weeks. What's well, taken down the training to games ratio, which before you might have played a game in Ulster and your next game wasn't for four weeks. You should have trained 16 times in that four weeks for one game. Whereas if you ask the players, the people to go for you, I think the split season is a great idea. I know for me playing club football, it is. I know what the summer is going to look like now. I have a bit of structure to it. And so I'll let me plan my life around it too. Yeah, yeah, no, I suppose it's, it's interesting to kind of hear your take on it. I suppose, I suppose not to kind of get too deep into it, but Gerald, I suppose the future of the game, because obviously we, we we did kind of say a couple of minutes ago, like the Leinster Championship has been dead realistically for the last, you could nearly say, 10 years at this stage, Ger. I know uh, Mead kind of nipped in and won one back in 2010 for Tewitis, really, and then, you know, Connacht Championship's not too bad. I suppose you've Mayo Gull or Common, you know, the, the Munster Championship's it is a joke, really, Jer. So, I suppose the future of the game going forward, like, would you be positive about it, Jer? If we can get the right structure, right people in place? You know, so I think, we're, you know, whatever structure you have in place, trying to football will still catch people's imagination. So, yeah. I wouldn't worry about it from that point of view. And I know a lot of the pundits are using the excuse that, oh, now we're competing again in the same shop window as uh, soccer and rugby, etc. Look, that's always going to happen. And, you know, there's always going to be major sporting events on at the same time, but I think the GA from that perspective could maybe just tweak their timings a wee bit and not maybe really clash. A game can be on at the same time as another major sporting event, but not at the same time. And these people can capture both. But in terms of going forward, like I think the GA is a good place. Crowds yeah. are coming back basically because I think COVID helped that because people were starved of it for 18 months. Yeah. Crowds are coming back. You know, and fair play to the Ulster Council on Sunday now. Like I had my wee lab with me and his ticket was only a fiver for a child's ticket. Oh yeah. You know, He's at the end of the game. Now, if it had been a 10 or a 15, I would have paid it. But I would say that the fact that they're pricing stuff like that as well, they're not pricing families out of it. I know the group concessions as well. The Leinster Championship was 40 euro, 40, 45. Or the, the Munster Championship final was 40, 45, yeah. I know that a standing ticket in uh, the terrace was only 17 sterling. You know, for okay. day sports going now, I realized about how they won the seating area on the far side of the Pat McGree and because Harris won the suit them, but it's only five five years. Now the Jerry Arthur stand was thirty five year old, but the time for the public of a cover just in case it rains, which is fair enough. Yeah. But given the day that it was, people were people were content to be out. I think that the Ulster Council is very good look at and they would probably put the biggest drive out of all the provincials into rolling their uh, provincial campaign because they're very crooked about it up here and they know that the, the appetite people have for it. Yeah, no, it's interesting you can say that because I was I was listening off uh, off the ball. Anthony Moyles was on there a few weeks ago, and he was kind of saying about the Leinster semi final, and he was getting tickets for like his uh, young kids as well. And I think he had to pay like forty euro for the Hogan stand. He wanted to sit in the Hogan. I'm not, I'm not sure why. Just maybe a good better seat. So maybe even the like uh, Ulster seems to be doing it right, but maybe the rest of the provinces aren't there. Yeah, well, I think that's why whenever you looked at the argument over structures last year, Ulster was very very vocal in keeping the keeping the provincial championships and also keeping it tied to all Ireland. They realise what it means to people in Ulster. So obviously I'm not part of the team was on the boardroom of any of the provincial, but I would just know what Ulster seemed to have their seemed to have got their house in order in terms yeah. of they run it, their timings of it, the marketing of it. Mm-hmm. I think other provincials could maybe take the lead from Ulster in that respect. 
Yeah, yeah, no, it'll be it'll be interesting to see what way it kind of pans out. Um, can we get uh, our house? Well, the you know Leinster, Connacht, and uh, um, Munster, but uh, we wait and see, uh, Jared. But um, kind of touching on to yourself, obviously uh, with the Derry senior footballers, and uh, probably as we said a couple of minutes ago, maybe one of your regrets was not to win an Ulster championship with the quality of players that you did have. I know a couple of injuries here and there maybe ruined your chances at times, but um, enjoyable stuff, kind of playing and representing Derry footballers as well, Jared. Yeah, well, obviously, you know, it's, I was at the All Ireland final in 1993, and I was only nine at the time. Somebody had told me nine years later, I'd be Captain Derry in an All Ireland minor title, and that same pitch on the same occasion, the same day, you'd never believe them. And it's only then, probably, when you get to that level of playing minor football, you start to even twig about playing senior football. And, you know, it's not as if it was an ambition of mine to play senior football at 14, because you never thought it could happen. But once you get into that environment of, 17, 18, you think, God, this one maybe isn't too far away. You know, I end up playing for days minors for two years and then straight into the seniors for 13. And out of the 15 years on the run, I have no regrets at it. No regrets now. Obviously, I wish I probably had a one more, but I have no regrets with doing it and enjoying it. I made great friends in it, you know, and I think that's the one thing you can take away from it. You started in 05 as well, Jared, didn't you? You got the ball rolling in 05. Oh four, oh four. We had, we had won the minors in O two, and I came into the squad in late in the summer of O three. But I was only just finishing school at the time as well because I was still playing, playing McCrory and Hogan football, yeah. and that took over that time. So I came into the squad fully in O four, and there I ended up getting a semi final in the first year, which they had me back to one since, and it was their that was their third semi final in maybe eight years between ninety eight and two thousand one. So at that time, you think we're definitely going to get the final if we've been to three semi finals, but yeah. of course, it doesn't work like that. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And obviously, we, we kind of touched on to uh, the Bradleys and uh, Muldoon. And, oh, I always was kind of amazing. Obviously, you've kind of Gilligan as well. He's he's flying with the, the Kilku lads. He was a great footballer for Derry. So, I suppose the early years, uh, Jer, how, like I've always asked it to kind of question the former players, but how enjoyable was it in the early years, Jer? Because realistically, the way it's gone now, it's gone so professional. You have GPS, you have every, like the game has just completely changed in uh, years gone by. So, how enjoyable was it in the early years, Jer? I be honest, I enjoyed it all my time, you know. I can remember us uh, in 04, that my first proper year, we we went a, a run through the back door. We won six games and we had to travel all around the country these games on a bus. And Mickey Moore and John Morrison was over at the time and they're quite a young team. And Mickey and John realised that and they let us enjoy ourselves after the games. The guys had a bit of fun. So and then they used them to knuckle down the next night and we actually got in a run to a semi final and I think that camaraderie and the crack that we built up definitely helped all that. But as I was finishing my career, the whole GPSs and stats and all that was coming heavily, heavily into it, you know, around 13, 14, 15. I finished in 16. And I even remember at one point, uh, in one year we were playing for the day, we used to get our blood ticking before training on a Tuesday. Right. It was fit to tell you then who was tired. It's just a wee pin prick in your, in your uh, fingertip. Okay. You put it under a lip you put on a bit of litmus paper and the uh, a wee jar, and you were fit to tell who was tired, who was sore from the weekend, but their blood reading. God. I think this was someone who was trying stuff for a PhD or something like that, but they uh-huh. had day with the music. And that, that's a far cry from probably in 04 when we started. The only thing you had to do was a urine test. Yeah. We, we urinated in the uh, a wee test tube, and you could tell who was severely dehydrated, that sort of thing. So. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Suppose I, I for me, John, to me, I get, I actually get drunk tested twice. Okay. During my career, so that shows you how much the GAs come on. Yeah, yeah, no, that's kind of what I'm saying. I suppose that kind of professionalism and the professionalism that really did bring to your life, Jer, and it's kind of gone, you know, four or five nights a week now at this stage, Jer. But did you enjoy the professionalism that it brought to your life over the years? I did, because it brought me structure and discipline that, you know, I'd be very much in the planning a lot, even. <laughs> even in terms of my own life and figuring the logistics and knowing where I'll be in a certain time, a certain day, because I still have so much going on with football outside of my own working life and that sort of stuff. So okay. I think that sort of structure, if you're if you're under that way, it gives you, you know, you write, you know on um, the week commence, whatever, you're going to be out four nights a week and you plan around that, you know. And I think any management team worth their salt will give players a diary of that sort of thing. Say, right, here's your February, March, April, 
shooting calendar organized around that. At the start, you sort of didn't get that, and it was tough. You were maybe working every maybe in two week blocks, but during the middle and end of my career, we were getting a training plan to start of February, and it took us right through to the championship and okay. April or May. I sort of let you to work around that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff, and I suppose yeah. Like, do you feel kind of over the years, like in the early years, and oh, you, you called it the day two sixteen. These did kind of have the panel of players like to kind of leapfrog you, like to the Ulster Championships, a potential All Ireland win. Because really, Jerry, at the end of the day, your own clubmen, um, Skinner and Paddy, Skinner and Paddy were some of the uh, probably the best forwards in Ulster at the time. Yeah, well, I'd always say Paddy, Paddy's probably Gary's best ever for. Uh, I think maybe only the last couple of years, Conor McManus has overtaken Paddy, top scorer from Ulster ever. You know, and that that would tell you a lot in itself. But guys, the guys that can get there, but not working hard either, I suppose. But if we had a deserved to win Ulster Championship, we would have won it. And we can't assure grips with that. Every year, I think, you know, Ulster's that hard to win. I don't think any team can flick it. So whoever actually won the Ulster Championship in any given year probably deserves it. And that's not to say that we didn't come close or you don't regret it, but it was just days that we just didn't turn up or days maybe the bounce of the ball didn't go for us. And when you look back on it, and you can have regrets, okay, but you, know, you can't, you know, you surely can't dwell on it that way either. Yeah, and I suppose the standard of Ulster football in the last couple of years has really intensified and it's great to see new teams winning it uh, nearly every year at this uh, stage year and I hope that obviously continues for a lot of counties. So you were, like, with the, the standard of kind of uh, Ulster football in years gone by, like when you're kind of starting off, you had Armagh, Tyrone, really at their pump, chair. so enjoyable times. Yeah, well, we are playing against uh, under Armagh team regularly getting the all Ireland semi-finals and finals and I think nearly between... I'm right in thinking between about 02 and 08, they shared every Ulster title, maybe. Maybe even further beyond that, you know. And uh, So it was hard for someone to break the duck there. I know it, like the Donegal, they've beaten two or three provincial finals in the middle of the Northeast. They got well beat there in Cook Park, where I'm at twice. Yeah. You know, in 04 and 06. So Donegal couldn't break that duck. Monaghan couldn't break that duck in that time either. Yeah. Tony Ramash shared them, shared them all in them eight or nine years. But it was up to the rest of us to play catch up, and yeah, was you had to really and the see work as they and a wee bit more because they had the building blocks already in place from 01, 02, and 03. And I suppose you can look over the fence and you can be envious of it, okay. But if you're if you're standing still stagnant, you never catch them. And we always strive to catch them, but unfortunately, we just didn't get there. And then come the, come the turn of the century and uh, 010, then. Morland come in a bit more and Donegal, so it meant then there was three or four teams there in that top block. It was probably yeah. harder to make the best of them. Yeah. Yeah, no, definitely, Chair. We've we've seen that in recent years, and I suppose it's, there's maybe a sense of underachievement, maybe because I know we obviously did tag on a, a national league title in, in a way, Chair. But is there a sense of underachievement for like the panel of players that's had, you know, the strong, strong clubs that we've seen in Derry over the years? Obviously, uh, Ball and Derry being definitely one of them, Chair. So maybe is there a sense of maybe unfulfillment? Yeah, well, it would be a sense of achievement when you look back on that. You know, they could have and should have achieved more, especially whenever you're comparing to some of the stuff we did do in the league. You know, like we won a league title in 08, Division 1. You beat in the final in 09, and I can also say hand and heart, we sort of landed in that league final by accident. 08, we set out to win the league, and that was a common goal at the start of the year. We said, look, one of the habit, etc. 09, Jimmy Cassie came in as manager, and he was trialing different stuff about, changing stuff up. We happened to go through the league playing good football and beating teams and we actually landed in a league final nearly by accident. And but that was because of the quality of player we had more so than anything. Fast forward then to 2013, we nearly breezed our way to a Division Two title where we beat West Leith in the final and went up to Division One, 2014. We landed in a league final again against Dublin. So mm. the guy played in three three Division One finals and one Division Two final. And if you're looking at that, then the championship was always six or eight weeks after that. I think that gap back at that time maybe knocked our momentum a bit. Whereas if it had been now with a league finish, the championship finish starts maybe three or four weeks after it, we could have kept that momentum going. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely, Jared, definitely. And I suppose tell me about your club mates, um, you know, Paddy and uh, Skinner, two absolutely sensational players. Uh, years go by, maybe injuries kind of ruined their career really to a degree, Jared, but two special players on their day. Yeah, well, I, I actually grew up with one of my, my mother and her mother's sisters as well, so we 
grew up together, you know, and over grannies in the backyard, all that sort of stuff. And like, in terms, you know, they're two, Olin Paddy is two different players, even though they're both forwards. Paddy was more of an out and out scorer, like, he was your guaranteed 1 4, 1 5 a game, man, every day. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was probably more prone to doing the spectacular. He'd come out the field a bit more. Still doing it, still doing it, is he? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Skinner was bigger, more athletic, stronger runner. Yeah. But, you know, back to the play with him for 20 years at the club rather than having to go mark him in club football was a blessing for me. You know, I was always playing with him. Mm. So I never had the unfortunate uh, chance to mark him like I know other players for 15, 20 years a day there, that even up to two years ago when Paddy stopped playing. Paddy was still regularly scoring up to you know, four against guys who were maybe on Peter and the edge of county squad, you know. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the longevity seems to be absolutely unbelievable. And I suppose uh, them two guys, and I know obviously, like 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 everything, there's obviously, I suppose you can nearly say a lot of kind of maybe politics, politics and uh, county setups, and maybe county boards and bits and pieces like that. Jer, so maybe talk about un- unfulfillment and underachievement. Uh, Paddy Bradley, really on his day, Jer, as you rightly said, he probably was Derry's best ever forward. So even touching on Paddy, do you feel maybe he could have got more out of himself with his Derry career? Well, it's. I think it was just unfortunate that his career finished with an injury. And, you know, Paddy, Paddy done his cruise ship in 2011, around uh, March time. Worked really, the guy I'm talking, Paddy worked really hard at it. Yeah. Paddy then done his cruise ship for the second time in 2012. Mm-hmm. So he just literally done it back to back. He worked really hard to come back again. And then in 2013, uh, remember, he's probably fit to play a lot of year or two of football. Brian McIver just decided to go a different direction. Mm-hmm. And Brian, he sort of went with youth at that time and just felt Paddy wasn't in the stands for whatever reason. But, you know, Paddy probably at that time was very, very annoyed about it because he hadn't worked so hard to get back in two cruciates. And he was finishing top score in the day club leagues in 13 and 14. So form-wise, it was definitely worth his place at that time. But, you know, for whatever reason, the manager didn't see fit. But, so I suppose from that point of view, Paddy has always written record to say that he was disappointed with the way his career finished. If you don't take a career over the course of that 18 months, you take his career over the course of when he started in 2000, over the 12 years beforehand. And what he had done for day in that time was, you know, he's said, like I've asked him before, he's up until Conor McMahon come along a couple of years ago, he's the top scorer from Ulster ever. You know, he was maybe the sixth, eighth highest scorer, and that's including uh, Cooper at the top, and your Kelly and O'Connor, your Brian Stafford, uh, Conor McManus. Uh, and then you're down on the Paddy and um, like Steve McDonald's after him, you know, so it shows the caliber boys get among there. Yeah, no, sick, sick man by all accounts. And I suppose, kind of, uh, Jerry, when you look back on us, uh, kind of playing for Derry in the, as I said at the start, the White Heat of Most Championship Battle, Clonus, um, absolutely at Derry, anywhere at all, the athletic grounds there, uh, Jerry. Really enjoyable times because this is, you know, you're testing yourself against the best. This is, you know, what you've trained for, what you've worked for. So uh, just really enjoyable times, Jerry. Yeah, the like, I actually love going to Clonus. And I went there on Sunday um, as a supporter this time. It was the first time I'd ever been on the outside looking in, whereas you were driving up the hill in Clonus in the bus, you're walking down to the back pitch to warm up, you're walking through the crowd at that time, and you're getting the feel of the atmosphere as a player. Clonus mm. is quite a claustrophobic stadium too. Yeah. Know, the, fans are, the fans are quite close into you, uh, as opposed to Casement or Crew Park. So I always love Clonus for that reason. And most, probably I'd say a group park would probably be my favourite ground to play in. and you say if you ever get the white heat of Austria Championship you're testing yourself against guys who you know have probably worked as hard at you as well and there's probably a paper thin uh, probably a paper thin of ability and strength and power between you it's a really good environment to test yourself no, 100%, 100%. Uh, great times indeed, Jaron. I suppose uh, presently uh, you're involved with uh, Rammer here in Cavan, the Rammer GA club, so you're giving John Brady a hand. So are you enjoying uh, kind of being involved in the Cavan GA kind of set up with the Cavan club scene? Yeah, well, I'll say I'm still playing for Mullen at home now as well. So uh, I'm living down there at the moment with my partner, but coaching was always my radar. So I've done six, seven years of coaching right up to a decent level, up until I got involved with Rammer, so we're down in Cavan during the week for the most part, and I'll be up in Glenall now for Friday, Saturday, Sunday, still playing with the club. Paddy's our club manager this year, so he understands that I miss one train in the week. It's just the guys working away, or guys working in Dublin for clubs, but once I was down there during the, during the week, 
told uh, to run with John and he'd asked me how I feel about maybe giving him a hand on a rammer and so far so good it's working during the week you know I don't get as many games as I probably like and maybe that might change over summer as things maybe ramp up a wee bit but so they're, they're it's a good club to be involved with working at a decent level and they're a good bunch of lads to coach yeah, yeah, no, I remember our going, uh, going for it this year, I feel, after last year, I suppose. Uh, the standard uh, of Cabin Club football, you know, the games that you have been at, uh, Jer, have you been impressed? Yeah, the standard's really high. You know, like, uh, you can't compare club football in, in most counties with the county team either because they're completely different types of game. And if you even look at the likes of some really, really strong club teams, the county teams don't perform that well. But I think across the board, Having club football and cricket football strong, mm-hmm. and I've been at six or seven of the Rammer games now, one or two of them at the start of the year. Maybe they were one a bit easier than they maybe thought. But the last six, seven games, you know, teams are maybe ramping up a wee bit, and every game has been different up this last while. And uh, Rammer have a set up there with a very much player led too, and they're very experienced, experienced in that regard. But in terms of the overall club football, are some fantastic footballers have come across. Yeah, yeah, no, it's a good quality now, I must say. And I suppose, again, as you were kind of saying, coaching probably is something you always wanted to do. So, you know, like being with the Rammer lads and obviously they're in the senior championship this year. So you'll uh, you'll see a lot of uh, good quality action this year, Jer. So is this something you always wanted to do, get involved with the kind of club uh, setup? Well, I would not necessarily get involved with a club setup, but coaching was always my forte. So I, uh, on the day I never stopped playing for the area, you always think right, I have more time in my hand. I can mm. remember stopped playing in September and October. Uh, club got me into my the under 13s at that time. I took them for five years, right through the under 17s. And it was difficult because it was still playing for the own club as well. So it was training two or three nights a week with coaching them the other two or three. So, so like, you didn't have as much time in your hands as you thought, but I enjoyed it. And then I got involved with Queen, Queen's University at Post Sigerson and Fraser level for four years. Mm. Worked with some fantastic coaches there, mm. but it was October to January, February, so that sort of suited. So working with a club team is something that uh, I didn't actually anticipate this early in my career because I'm still playing for my own club. And mm. You're trying to balance the two of them, and it's you know you're very wary of maybe giving some of them uh, sixty or seventy percent and not giving the hundred into it. Mm. Now my logistical situation is a wee bit different than most, so I can probably do that. Monday to Friday with Rammer and still play for the long day on Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Sitting at the moment and yeah, it is good good to be involved with a club team who have a good set of players who are, if you use the word inverted commas, very coachable, mm. very willing to learn, very open to new ideas and it's also teaching me a lot of things then from the uh, playing perspective as well. Absolutely, Jerry. Absolutely. I suppose uh, your club, Glen Newland, obviously you've been playing for them for 20 years plus and uh, still uh, still battling away from them. Obviously, Paddy managed them. So, what does uh, Glen Newland uh, mean to you, Jerry? Well, it all means I was rare down it. You know, my family history steeped down it, my wider family history steeped down it, but living in the heart of the community, you know, growing up here all my life, you know, my club means everything to me. And, you know, I'd be lying if I said, you know, whatever, I was down in Cavan. Uh, I was living in, living in Bayern as often. There was a few clubs who sort of asked me, look, you're living here, would you feel about maybe come to play for us? But that was never an option for me because at the stage of my career, I'm 37 now, I don't think it would have benefited anything from moving away from your own club in terms of playing. Okay. But, uh, so the fact that Paddy still gives me that bit of Well, clubs asked you, do you know. mind me asking? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I can't remember their name now offhand, but it was just, you know, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, all of these clubs as well, you know, I would be fair to them. Like I told them all, look, I wasn't, I'm not interested in playing for another club. But I also said to all of them, I'm, I I, can feel a couple of bad injuries there in the last few of the years. So player you maybe thought you would have been getting, you wouldn't have been getting. So, I, I, you know, now in terms of experience and all that there, it's a wee bit different what you can bring to a setup. But I had a, I had a bad back there for a while. It hurt my leg and all sort of stuff. So I sort of come back from two years of injuries all in all. Touch wood, I'm not too bad at the minute. So, and I, but Paddy's playing me a net for that reason because my body maybe just can't hold up as much as, as I would like. But it's suiting me at the minute now the way it's going. So, I'll continue to play for as long as I can. 
Super stuff. Uh, your junior B is good crack, Jer, so don't worry. <laughs> oh, well, I spent about 22 years playing Division 1 football in the area. Yeah. Intermediate. That's just the level we're at at the minute, and we have to adjust to that as a club, and we have to try and bring young players through, mm. get them to play at a level where they can beat at a high level of intermediate, and then make that step up to senior, consolidate your position, but that's not done overnight, and I know from our own club it's important for the guys that may stay about for that couple of brothers in the 35 plus bracket a couple of yeah. mates in that bracket and for that reason we'd be seen as an aging team but they're keeping us boys about for that reason they help that experience and bring the young players through 100% sure 100% and uh, last two you've been brilliant with your time uh, what kind of advice would you kind of give maybe to a young kind of Jared, Jared O'Kane around the country trying to make the breakthrough because obviously Jerry has been involved in the game for so long so what advice kind of would you give them I would say probably probably enjoy probably enjoy it a wee bit more. I was I'd have been very intense, especially at the start of my career, you know, even though I talk about some of the days I enjoy the day, but I'd have been very intense and sort of you're beating yourself up about it, you know, and probably, you know, getting beaten in a club league game on a Sunday, I'd have dwelled on it to a Wednesday or Thursday. Mm. It probably does you no good in the long run, it does the people around you no good either. Mm. You know, you play to enjoy it and I've seen some of the day players now since they beat her own Rory Gallagher came out and said in an interview, oh, I told him to take her disco shirt with him tonight. We're all going out. They've done the same against Modern, even though the Austria final was only two weeks away. But you have to enjoy, you have to enjoy them days because they don't come around that often. And mm-hmm. law average tells you that you get maybe beaten as many games as you won. It's basically, you don't want that many big games. So the ones you do want, enjoy them like that because yeah. you'll be over in the click of a finger. Brilliant stuff, brilliant stuff. And oh, the question again for coming to my head. Uh, potential uh, Talton Cup winners and All-Ireland winners this year, do you reckon? I think the Talton Cup winners, I think Cavan are the hot favourites. Like, you know, you look at how Cavan pushed on a goal, Cavan would have been disappointed now he knocked down at half time. Mm. He had four points up. Mm. Uh, they disposed of down with 10 points. Now, Fermanagh will be tough for them, but I think if they go over Fermanagh, there's a fair chance they'll want it because Tipperary have now slipped up on the other side as well. God, yeah. Up on the side of Fermanagh. You know, if you looked at the Division 3 and Division 4 finals that was all in Coop Park that day, yeah. the Division 4 final was a better fair than the Division 3 final above it. Better standard of football, there's better players yeah, playing on that yeah. side with Cavan and Tipperary. Uh-huh. Cavan have probably found themselves there. <laughs> have been going. I would have them as firm favourites for Touching Cup. The all Ireland series is harder to call, to be honest, because it's Hard to know where Dublin and Kerry have been pushed to the limit. Derry yeah, have been pushed to the limit in three games. But I'd be quite confident Derry could go one or two steps further for that reason, knowing that they've been there and they've backed it up. Uh, but I'll, I could probably give you a better surmise than the semi final stage, because at that stage you'll know once once you scratch the team's surface, you sort of know if they have it or not. And I think maybe enough of the teams haven't had that yet. Yeah. yeah they, obviously, you ask me now and you're telling me on it. I'm just going to say Kerry because Common and Jack, you know, they've brought, brought Jack O'Connor back for that reason, that reason only, as to get no air. And mm-hmm. they do have the players to do it. And I certainly wasn't questioning the mentality because a lot of them do a decent underage system on one plenty. But it'll just be interesting to see how they're coping on the bigger days. The guy was in Cook Park in 19. They missed a penalty against Dublin. They were man up for I think, 45 minutes. And it's still yeah. a good game. Like, yeah. So, so I think that question works still over that Kerry side and until they do yeah. one one questions will continue to be asked. Yeah, get them inside of Croke Park here and we, we'll wait and see how they're fixed, I suppose. Uh, but they are looking very good so far. And I suppose last question, Jer. Um the best player you played with and the toughest player you played against. Best player I played with would have been Paddy. And I would say that without hesitation, no thought. As for club and county. It was just, you know, it was at a different level, but he was at a different level for 10, 11 years. You know, mm-hmm. it's not as if he was too, you know, Paddy was getting nominated for an All Star in 01, and he had won an All Star in 07. Uh, up up here in the north, we have various huge All Stars. Yeah. Paddy's maybe, Paddy maybe five of them. At the time when Tron Normal was cleaning up, yeah. Paddy's maybe the third or fourth highest in the role of honour there. Because every year, consistently, year in, year out, he was doing it. Uh, best player I played against. Uh, Directly, you know, Mark, uh, probably Colin McManus. You know, I marked Colin Cooper a couple of times in league football, and probably at that stage of the year, it just wasn't the be on the end off of the Gooch. 
but I've marked McManus a few different times in different scenarios and it's just a real handful right and left foot he's strong he's decent in the air faster than he looks actually you know like I remember vividly playing Monaghan in 2010 one year took a Zenith skin and I was a yard or two ahead of him I can remember running to the ball and he came past my right hand shoulder just literally just come out of nowhere took the ball and whipped it over the bar genius and yeah. that time I thought and he had only been on the scene maybe two or three years, which I was maybe six or seven years. Yeah. That time I thought, God, this boy's going to be hard to watch. And then you're lucky to go on between... Uh, Still playing. Like... Maybe, maybe between 13 and 18, he won three All-Stars, won two All-Stars with Monaghan, and he, he was he was, he was tormenting the best defences in Ireland. You know, that's five, six year period, whenever he's his peak. Do you reckon there's much more in him? I don't know what way is. I know he struggled with a hip injury and he's probably managed his load year in, year out, but you know, it's hard uh, if you have a player that got on form, it's hard not to pick him. He had a, he had a solid enough year so far. You'll probably find out more against Mayo because he's so accurate. But as I think the injury toll on his hip and the FD managed his load a lot more. But I was sort of semi impressed with him against the area. I was behind the net and he he was given Paul McGrogan plenty of. Uh, Stood for thought at the same time while Chrissy had marked Jack McCarn and he was holding him out. Whereas Comet Manor then had to do a lot of running and he, was, he seems to be playing a wee bit deeper this time. He's come out the field a bit more. He's come out the field a bit more against Down as well. So mm. maybe they're trying to change his game up that way. But I would say that uh, he'll be very reluctant to retire at that age because once he does go, you know, that's you finally. You know, it's not as if you can retire at 30 and come back at 32. Once he goes, he'll probably go with a heavy heart. Mm, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how that uh, shapes up for Conor McManus. Jerry okay, thanks a million for joining me this week. And of course, this podcast is brought to you by orgretcher.com and the Tactic D. Use promo code JMAC podcast to get 15% off on orgretcher.com. I get the best games, gloves, equipment on Tactic D. Be attack minded. Jerry Kane, absolute pleasure to talk to you. Hopefully, I'll see you uh, in the Calvin, uh, Calvin Championship games. Uh, Ram will be playing, so we'll be keeping a good eye and I might bump into you in the next couple of months. But, uh, Jerry, thanks a million. Cheers. Rob, I'm off here now to celebrate Queen's Jubilee, so uh, as a, I have a few days off work, so we're going to go out and do parties and all that sort of stuff up around home here, so you can imagine. <laughs> Brilliant stuff, Chair. Happy days. Thank you. Oh, yes. Okay.